Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing today on mine safety. Uh, the last time this committee held a mine safety hearing was nearly two and a half years ago, and there are a number of urgent issues that need to be addressed. Today, the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, published an article documenting the single largest cluster of advanced black lung cases ever reported in the medical literature. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, otherwise known as NIOSH, verified 416 cases of progressive massive fibrosis, or PMF, in three small black lung clinics in Southwest Virginia. And researchers, and researchers believe that there are even more cases yet to be verified. Moreover, this report left out wide swaths of Appalachian mining communities that are likely affected as well. If we could see uh, slide one of black lung images, please. It's behind you. Uh, PMF, or progressive massive fibrosis, is a debilitating and often fatal disease. The three pictures displayed on the screen illustrate the gravity of this health condition. The photo on the left shows a normal healthy lung. The photo in the center shows the lung of a minor with black lung disease. This lung has coal nodules embedded throughout. A minor with this level of disease would have great difficulty breathing. Now the photo on the right shows the lung of a minor with PMF. The lung is filled with large masses of dense black tissue. A minor with PMF would find it nearly impossible to walk across this hearing room. Without a lung transplant, this condition is a death warrant. Even a lung transplant, without, with even a lung transplant, it would only add a few years to that minor's life. As you can see, I want to go to slide two. Uh, as you can see on this chart, the documented cases of PMF have been on the rise since the late 1990s. And what we are witnessing today is a health crisis that requires an immediate response. I hope we will hear what the Assistant Secretary plans to do about this documented surge in PMF cases. It's clear that this cannot be solved by rolling back rules that protect minors, including MSHA's respirable dust rule. April 5th of this year marks the eighth anniversary of the Upper Big Branch mine explosion, which took the lives of 29 miners in America's worst coal mine disaster in 40 years. The cause, according to numerous investigative reports and a criminal trial, was the reckless conduct of Massey Energy's corporate executives who consistently put coal production ahead of safety. The tools that MSHA could use to hold Massey and other rogue miners accountable were rendered ineffective. This committee heard testimony from coal miners, mine inspectors, mine engineers, agency officials, and the families of the Upper Big Branch miners about specific weaknesses in the Mine Act that needed to be remedied. The majority said we should wait on legislating until all of the investigative reports had come in. The last of the six reports was completed in February of 2012. But still, the committee has been unwilling to move even one of the dozens of recommended reforms. Let me highlight three of these, of these key reforms, which are in the Robert C. Byrd Mine Safety Protection Act of 2017, otherwise known as H.R. 1903. It was introduced by ranking member Bobby Scott. First, this act provides MSHA with subpoena power, subpoena authority, to conduct inspections and investigations. An agency whose mission is protecting minors <coughs> from serious injury or death needs this basic tool of subpoena authority. Second, it authorizes a felony a sanction for criminal violations of the Mine Act. The current sanction is a misdemeanor. Federal judges and prosecutors, as well as editorial pages across coal country, have criticized the misdemeanor sanctions as wholly inadequate to deter the most egregious conduct. 
Third, this act would codify the pattern of violations regulations adopted by MSHA. This addresses the small subset of mine operators who systematically violate safety standards. Pattern of violations has a history that dates back to the chairmanship of Carl Perkins, whose portrait we see right up there, and who conducted the hearings that are in this, uh, uh, in this transcript. And he was responsible for the passage of the 1977 Mine Act, which created the Mine Safety and Health Administration, MSHA. In 1976, following two successive explosions at the Scotia Mine that took the lives of 23 miners, and, seven, and three federal mine inspectors, Congress learned that the mine had been ordered closed 110 times in the six years prior to the explosion, and regulators issued 420 safety and health violations in the two years prior to the explosion. Repeated citations were not an adequate deterrent. Congress included in the 1977 Mine Act the pattern of violation sanction which gives MSHA an additional tool to rein in serial violators who systematically disregard the safety of their minds. Once on this sanction, each and every time there is a significant and serious violation, operators must withdraw miners from the mine until the violation is corrected. Unless a mine remains free from significant and serious violations for 90 days, it cannot be removed from this sanction. This provision of law was not implemented for 33 years, according to the Inspector General, because of loopholes in the implementing regulations. MSHA finally plugged these loopholes in 2013, following the Upper Big Branch disaster. In 2014, Murray Energy, the Ohio Coal Association, and the Kentucky Coal Association sued to overturn MSHA's 2013 rule. Following a change in the administration, these plaintiffs sought settlement discussions. Assistant Secretary Zetazalo, who has joined us today, previously chaired both the Ohio Coal Association and the Kentucky Coal Association. I have serious questions about whether the Assistant Secretary can have any role in these settlement negotiations. At a minimum, I would say there is an appearance of a, con of a conflict of interest, which highlights the need for transparency in the closed door negotiations with the plaintiffs. I want to thank the Secretary for appearing here today, and I welcome his testimony. I look forward to hearing it. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman.